Um, it's almost going. This is uh, this is my first first Canary Collective podcast. So thank you so much for being the first guest. Well, I feel honored and I love that you're doing this. <laughs> I, I have had a dream of being able to interview you. Like I've been like taking notes for the last year and being like making a list of the dream people that I would want to work with. And you were first on the list. Oh, that's really sweet. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, this is Nikki and Luke. <laughs> Amazing powerhouse mother son team and are you still in maine we are yes we currently live in freiburg maine it's the western mountains along the northern new hampshire border are you kind of in a, a more rural situation where you live yes yes currently um i'm in the living room of my parents house in eddington maine which is more of the central to eastern uh part of the state so yeah, we decided um, to come here and help them out at the house for a little while because they've been quarantined for some time, as we have. So we figured that move was safe um, to do for, for a spell. Yeah. Yeah. And Luke, are you um, doing school remotely? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> How's that going? Kind of all right. It's still something to get used to even after a month. Yeah. I mean, you you have you're you're sixteen now, so are you a junior? In yeah. High school basically. That's just it yeah. sucks. <laughs> sucks. Cool. Like, there's <laughs> no way around that. And you were you've been doing organizing together for years and years. When I met you, I think you were like nine or ten. Um <laughs> So we met, Nikki, Sakura, and I met um, at the James Lawson Institute for training in nonviolent strategic direct action and community organizing in Nashville. And we then re-met Luke and Nikki and I marched together in the People's Climate March in New York City. I think we were holding some cloth, huge sign. Yeah, it was a 300 yard long banner that could be seen from the tallest sky skyscrapers, if you remember. And I was my job to recruit, I think, up to 200 people to carry this huge banner that <laughs> I couldn't really see the other end of it. But yeah, we were at the head of it trying to, you know, pace ourselves so that way we didn't get a lot of slack in the length of it. But yeah. Well, I that's a really great metaphor for organizing that you're doing. It's like you can't see the end of it, but you're holding your piece. And who knows the like legacy that you're leaving even after we're gone. Like so much of your work is making a difference. So, yeah, I just want to thank you both for holding down the fort and like just being badasses continually um, <laughs> and inspiring me. I wanted to start this podcast. I was just listening to a podcast with Aaron Brockovich, uh, oh, one of yeah. the badasses of the world who's also working on water rights. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, if you see something, say something. And I kind of feel like that's what I'm trying to do because since I became disabled by chronic illness, I started to see something that I felt like wasn't being talked about enough and that like the the ties between our human health and our environmental health are so connected. And so many of my friends are getting sick and are having chronic illness issues. And we're not tying that enough to environmental stuff that's going on from yeah. the wildfire smoke pollution and air pollution and water, um, our agricultural system being messed up by Monsanto. Mm -hmm. So. I did this album of songs called The Canary Collective and the first song on it is called Been to the Future. And I didn't want to just put out songs. I wanna talk about the messages behind the songs with the people who inspired the songs. So you are number one. Been and I listened to it a number of times. It was, it, I liked the song a lot. Did I play it to, 
I guess it was like laid up at night in my room and I would just, I actually, there were two different nights where I played it. That was the last thing I listened to before I went to sleep. So it was kind of nice. Oh, yeah. I hope you have good, <laughs> good dreams of time yeah. travel. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the song was in, inspired by a t-shirt that you wore. <laughs> uh, do you still have that? Sure. I do. I don't have it. Oh, I know. I should have worn oh, yeah. that shirt for this. <laughs> I know. Um, the shirt said, I've been to the future and we won. And it was, you know, knowing the work that you and Luke have been doing for years, fighting water privatization in Maine and beyond and all around the world. Um, water privatization, you can explain more about what that means, but just knowing that you're doing this work and imagining what would the world be like if we won. And what would it feel like if we went into the future and we knew that we won and then we came back to the present day? How would that affect how we organized? So I just want to ask that of you, like if you could go into the future and know that the water privatization movement won, what would that look like in the future? And how would knowing that affect your work now? And I'll start with Luke, actually, because Luke <laughs> you are the future <laughs> and um, you might have to go soon. I didn't mean to rope you into this podcast. So, I mean, you're welcome to stay for the whole thing, but. <laughs> I'll, I'll stay as long as I can. Um, man, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it would be a double-edged sword, honestly, because it would be like, you know, people would be really hopeful and energetic um, because there's no guarantee that we're going to have a, healthier livable future under the current conditions of you know corporatism and stuff like that and just all this you know crazy stuff we're seeing um so i think it would be good to have you know kind of a, a boost in morale but um i think also you know humility is a huge aspect of organizing which i think i try to hold myself accountable to and just not like just making sure we're following all the steps we need to um to make sure that we can win and um I don't know I think the first part is more important about getting that boost to morale but you know um if we assume we've already won then you know that's never you know history shows us that assuming we'll win something is never a good idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's tricky it's a it's a mind warp to think of time warps but i think that's a, such a good point that you have to make sure you're doing all the steps that it takes to have that fate come true so what are some of the i hear that you're organizing a candidates forum tomorrow a youth candidates forum what is that gonna look like and is that one of the steps that you feel we have to take yeah yeah um yeah i think it is a step um i think you know an electoral politics are a tricky game just because i personally think that more more good can be done outside of the electoral system with grassroots organizing than can be done inside of it right now um, but I think it is important to make sure we're electing the right leaders who will create more favorable, uh, conditions for the movement to grow and for, um, you know, who will at least advocate for more sustainable policies than what we're seeing right now. Um, so I think in terms of reducing the harm that's being done, I think it's very important to make sure that people know who is actually advocating for the right policies and um, who we can trust with our future. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we gotta hold them accountable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even though it's hard to have faith, I think mm -hmm. um, bringing up certain questions about water privatization right now amongst politicians or to be politicians using that platform um, for their followers because there's an opportunity to educate them on where does this leader stand and as we know some of them 
agree with us wholeheartedly. So however they answer the question about water privatization that Luke's posing, and that's one of our strategies on how to create a water platform in the state of Maine. Um, the last governor's election cycle, we managed to have the first ever water platform. And it took a lot of hard work and many different avenues to get people excited about talking about uh, water privatization or even having enough information so that they could develop a stance or have an opinion about it. Now, there were some candidates who um, just, you know, like oil and water, <laughs> just not going to discuss it because, you know, Nestle, for instance, gives so much money to our local politicians. Um, they're one of the largest corporate contributors to both sides of the aisle. And they've essentially colonized our state house with their lobbying teams. They hold positions of power within our state agencies. And so there's some people that won't touch the issue. Um, so um, with those that will, um, using that platform at, while people are paying attention, um, for them to express an understanding that this is a huge problem ahead of us. And what is that future going to look like with privatization if we don't um, adjust our policies right now to prevent worst case scenarios? So that's been really important. And again, with a youth voice in the forum that Luke's doing is, you know, to continue at the US congressional level that that conversation continues because it's not being had at the national level. And it's interesting because um, the following week after the shutdown happened, um, I on March 24th, I was supposed to testify in front of a congressional committee on the bottled water industry and they had to postpone it until things open up again. So who knows when that's gonna happen or if it's gonna even happen at this point, you know, nothing certain. Uh, the bottled water industry would love that conversation to not happen because the um, US House Committee on Oversight and Reform was the committee that was hosting me to testify, you know, give testimony in DC. So, um, Wow. Yeah, <laughs> and surely Nestle would be in the room listening to everything I had to say, but I'm not revealing secrets. I'm just telling them the story about rural Maine and their tactics, their divisive tactics and, and the, the problem as it's grown in our state. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm feeling like if we aren't able to travel or gather or lobby in person, I mean, my job used to be getting people from around the country to lobby their members of Congress to go into the office and share their stories about how immigration law is affecting them, et cetera. And that, so if we can't do that, can we use video lobbying more? Are we gonna have to right. tell our stories virtually? And so if you did have Nestle and the committee before you, what would you say about your story of how water privatization is affecting rural Maine? Hmm. Do you want to go first on that question? Uh, I think you should go first. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it. yeah, I, I mean, we live in a frontline community, so we can speak, um, you know, from that firsthand account just within Freiburg alone. Um, the fact that Nestle was able to secure a 45 year exclusive contract that gives them the upper hand of control over our groundwater is unprecedented. This was a 45 US, year, you know, little rural Maine, a U.S. precedent setting case that Nestle had attempted out on the West Coast, but failed because people very quickly saw, well, they tried to go for a 50 year contract, but people realize that was ridiculous. We can't predict the future, right? <laughs> and if we're gonna win, looking back from the future, I think this is one thing is stopping all contracts for that length, they should not be happening. Um, with changes in our climate, population growth surges as we're seeing. I mean, I was born in 1970 and our global population has doubled since that time. The amount of water sources on this planet has remained the same. You know, they're the same now as they were 500,000 years ago and will likely be the same 
500,000 years from now. So um, our water sources are, are pretty static. Granted, you know, there's a hydrological cycle where things can be renewed, but it's recycling the same amount of water. Now, whether it's frozen in ice caps, or if it's in the ground, or if it's flowing over the surface, or trapped within the evaporation and rainfall cycle, you know, it's dispersed. But um, it's there's no guarantees because less than two percent of the planet's water is actually drinkable. So when you think about that smaller percentage in this exponentially pop growing population, you know, how will those resources be allocated in the future, especially when you know, we can't get um, polluting industries to, to stop polluting our, our water sources. And so without accountability, uh, corporate accountability to the polluters, um, we're really on a dangerous collision course. And so where are people's water gonna come from if they don't have access to clean water? Well, Nestle has a solution is they're gonna take it from Maine, put it in plastic bottles and ship it all the all the way around the planet and it's going to go to people who can afford it it's yep. not equitable it's not just people will be marginalized very quickly without access to clean water and that's the trajectory that we're accepting every time we buy bottled water granted i don't want to shame people who are in acute water emergencies for drinking bottled water um, our friends in flint michigan who for the past six years shamefully Flint for the past six years has not had access to clean water. They were essentially poisoned by their government um, in a very unjust situation. And so we need to take care of water problems on a local basis. The fact that Flint doesn't have clean water, they need to source clean water locally. Um, and it's a shame that not very far away, Nestle is pulling um, water and selling it in, in bottles, but it's not all going to Flint. They're not getting relief. They're having to purchase their own bottled water. Granted, they make occasional donations and give it to people, but the lines for that are long. And yeah. bottled water should only ever be a temporary emergency um, usage. Yeah, stop but, it up. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, moving water resources all over the world, that is just not sustainable. It takes a lot of energy to do it. The containers take a lot of oil. Um, and what does that do to a local hydrological cycle to remove massive amounts of water? Of course, it's going to change the pH balance in soils over time. And aquifers, once they collapse, they won't rebound. as what we're seeing in the central part of the United States. So... Um, you know, bottled water is a relatively new thing, but, you know, I think if we're going to the future and looking back, if we don't put the brakes on this now, it's going to be a hard lesson learned and much like, you know, how we treated the Midwest and centralizing our food systems and using up too much of the water and why that aquifer is due to be out of water within the next 25 years. It's pretty sad and we don't need to go there. If you could have like three of the decision makers who are, let's be honest, probably older, rich white men who yeah. are, who would have the most power to turn this around. And they're sitting right here. Mm. Hi, what do you have to say for yourself? Like, what would you say to me? What would you say? What do you have to say? Oh, well, if, if you were a, a powerful lawmaker? Yeah, if I were a, a Nestle CEO and a uh, head of, a committee for deciding the contracts. What would you say? <laughs> huh? What would let's do you have? What would you say, Luke? Do you have an idea? What I would, would angrily berate them for five minutes first. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. What would you say? Just pretend. Oh my gosh. Well, um, shame on you for perpetuating colonialism by monopolizing water sources across the world and then denying people access to them because they simply can't afford your product um and uh um in terms of anything constructive i might have to say probably just consider the the long-term cost of what you're doing outside of possible financial gain for you and a few other rich white people um you know, I, I would tell them to go to the communities that they're affecting most across the world and, um, 
you know, come to Freiburg, uh, go to, you know, places in Western Africa where Nestle is, you know, extracting vast amount of water while people are facing worse droughts than they've ever seen. And just to look at the, 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 the cost of what's that, what that's doing to the environment and to the people. Um, and then I would tell them to <laughs> dissolve the business. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know. I just yeah, it's not a situation where you want not, the workers yeah. to take control <laughs> because yeah. it's it's a business that shouldn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, what should exist instead? What kind of businesses and industries should they put their investment into? I mean, public water systems. Mm -hmm. You know, that I mean that can provide plenty of jobs. Just like improving water infrastructure and mm -hmm. working on more like sustainable food systems for distributing food um, and programs that, you know, like bottled water is not it, but I think there are better ways to um, make sure that people in areas that are facing um, uh, water scarcity, there are better ways for people to have steady access to water. So I think there's, there are plenty of opportunities for jobs and mm -hmm. for um, a boost to the economy um, in ways that don't just benefit a wealthy few. Um, okay, so I'm the Nestle CFO. All right, young man, if you are saying that I could actually make more money longer term if I funnel my resources into public water infrastructure and creating lots of jobs so that people have filtered clean water and we can also just build infrastructure for i mean that's going to be a massive undertaking that's a new frontier maybe okay maybe i'll just <laughs> it's yeah. well i would say you it's, know the nestle ceo would have to take a seat now, the Nestle CEO would have to take 10 seats, like sit all the way down. And we'd have to talk to municipal leaders on how to build a nonprofit model um, and divert some government um, tax dollars towards maintaining infrastructure because um, infrastructure all over the United States is woefully inadequate, needs replacing, and there's billions and billions of dollars worth of infrastructure that ha needs to happen in every single one of our states. There's plenty of work there, um, you know, fun, uh, just reallocating some money from the war industry, right? There's a lot of, um, let's take Bath Ironworks. So they're a large main employer who um, produces um, warships. Um, so we have, is it Raytheon? Or is it, um, I, is it, oh, shoot. Raytheon or, or what's the other? Something system. Yeah, they do defense contracting anyway, yeah. but they would have the ability there to create, you know, pipes and upgraded infrastructure right there. And so instead of making some warships that often end up, sitting and not being used because they produce a lot of excess. They'll take contracts just to keep people, workers busy. Um, but do we really need to spend it on, on, on defense big ticket items? Instead, we could be upgrading all of our infrastructure in the United States right now uh, based on water. So Nestle can take a seat because a for-profit model is not healthy to mix with um, water systems anyway, because you would need um, shareholders that would consistently need a, a larger return on their investments. And that's just going to drive up the cost for everybody's water delivery. So and it's not the price of water, it's the cost of delivery that we're maintaining. And so um, we do need a lot of investment from our federal government to come in and so we can avoid the Flint situations um, and do some mitigation uh, so that way we can have you know healthy sources and holding polluting corporations accountable for poisoning our, our water sources so and it's really sad right now during um, this whole crisis that the Trump administration 
Trump administration decided to uh, roll back a lot of the protections. And so we're not going to see that accountability. And will there be an uptick of water destruction um, due to this? You know, we won't know until it's over. But yeah, you know, we have such a problem as it is. This is only going to exacerbate it. Yeah, we have to keep an eye on those things because we're going to be gaslit for years when we, well, my water's coming out brown. Well, the levels say that they're normal, so you're right. fine. You know, that's, right. that's how it works. And right. how's Arsenic, sorry. Yeah, you're going to have to, to, you know. Yeah. yeah. In the face of the pandemic, I think just with my illness journey, I kind of, that bubble was burst. For me, when you think that you can trust the experts, when they, like the FDA or the blood tests that you get to test a disease, you think you can trust the experts to say, well, this is a safe level, or no, you don't have the virus because your antibodies aren't showing up in your blood test. And going through 10 months of blood tests and having them say nothing is coming up in your body, but knowing that there are, they're not testing for toxicity. I mean, I was living in a house in DC where the water coming out was brown and everyone living in the house was uh, having a chronic cough. And whenever we would like go away for the weekend, it would go away and then we'd come back to the house. But you, you know, that bubble is shat burst for me because I know that you can't quite trust these tests because the interest of the, the public, the general public is, is not what's driving these regulations it's the the profit right. company model who yeah. own the patents to the tests and and who are you know pg and e who are putting chromium six accidentally right. in the water supply so yeah i i actually had a bit of hope though um a hopeful turn a glimpse into what could be a future in which we won by watching Return of the River yesterday. Have you seen that documentary? No, oh, it sounds like I should, yeah. It's really good. If you need a morale boost, um, okay. it's really, have you heard of the Elwha River in Washington State and the dam removal? Oh, okay, yeah. The, yeah, these um, amazing activists uh, supported these amazing indigenous Native American communities uh, over the span of many, many years to advocate for the removal of the Elwha, the dam at the Elwha River, which was totally messing up the salmon populations and thus all of the animal kingdom and thus everyone's health. And But they were relying on that, like harnessing of the river's power for this mill, you know, in yeah. Port Angeles. But I was looking at wildsalmon.org, they were debunking all these myths that it's actually going to be like a huge sacrifice financially. It's like, actually, if you transition to these renewable ways of getting electricity and power and water, it's going to save all of us money because we have yeah. spent billions and billions of dollars in salmon, in taxpayer dollars for salmon restoration attempts that haven't even been working and so it was so cool to see they interviewed some of the committee members who were the decision makers who decided at first all of these committee members who were supposed to decide whether or not they were going to remove the dam they were very against the dam removal but they were persuaded and they ended up reaching consensus and being unanimous voting to tear the dam down mm -hmm. so they interviewed the committee members what was persuasive to you you know what what yeah. made you change your mind and that's really nice it doesn't happen very often but it is possible to change people's minds yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's why engagement is so important and just continuing to show up because you know sometimes it takes somebody hearing things three times before they start to think differently or invites them to, you know, get out of their regular mindset. Some people it takes a hundred times and different angles, different stories, but you know, nothing's impossible and that's for certain. And, um, you know, just finding those magic points or those magic moments where you can reach somebody in their space where they're at um, in their thought process. But it's interesting that you told that story about the Elwha because we had a similar story here just down river from where we live just a few miles away where there was a major river restoration along the Penobscot. Now the Penobscot River, it covers two thirds of our state. 
and there was a major dam there, which removing this had allowed um, salmon and other fish over a thousand miles of the inland waterways by removing wow. it. And that was done, what year was that? How many years ago? No? Six, five years ago, six years ago? Yeah. And so that was another powerful um, event that had happened here. And, you know, there's, we've only been able to see what the benefits were since that coming down, but it took a long time in building those relationships and exposing um, all the harm and, and showing that it's really not beneficial at the end of the day to have these massive dams and centralizing our power systems over a river like that. Yeah. What are some moments that either of you could point to or one moment that really helped you feel like, wow, I'm part of a solution? Like whether it was a victory, that even if it was reversed or something, like what was a memory? It's something that's a victory in your work. Yeah. And I think with water, I mean, there hasn't been, because we did, we lost that Supreme Court case that we took, you know, for the 45 years, went all the way up to the main state Supreme Supreme Court and we lost. However, the education and the process coming out of that, people finally saw that, oh, Nestle is a problem. This is a problem. And um, it really put that conversation, at, you know, to put a face to the story, put a marker on the map to the story and identified where the problem resides. Um, and we've had some other bills that we've worked on since then where you know, again, it's not been successful yet, but it seems like we grab some more people along the way at each step. And we also attempted to block um, a, an appointee to our Board of Environmental Protection two years ago um, when the outgoing governor decided he was going to appoint a Nestle employee to our Board of Environmental Protection. And they were going to go and be appointed with no hiccups, no problems. And none of the major environmental organizations even stood up to say no to this. Um, because number one, Nestle has that much power. And so I was like, all right. So I just put it on blast. And <laughs> it was funny because um, Capital Security was called that day because they didn't know where the, all of this opposition was coming from because none of the envi big environmental organizations were behind this, but uh, the city got flooded with so many emails, they were put on alert. And even though he was appointed, you know, I stayed long, long hours on that day that we went up and testified against his appointment. We were only two votes shy in the Senate of completely blocking his appointment. And this was supposed to go through unanimously, both sides of the aisle, no problem. And wow. so it just shows, you know, if, if you're willing to show up and, and communicate with people and get people moving, um, you know, it just shows you what's possible. So we yeah. do have the opportunity to turn things around um, and we're getting there. It's just, we're just not quite there yet. Um, so, you know, when I'm looking back in this from the future and we've won, would we do anything differently? Probably not right now. Um, we're doing everything that we can, unless the strategy was revealed in that moment. <laughs> too, that was nice. So <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, okay, there's that, you know, because you can see things much more clearly from that, you know, vantage. So if we were given all the information, then there's probably plenty of things um, that we would adjust. And of course, even in that situation, um, there's two other people I probably could have moved a little bit differently and maybe we could have just tilted one person to vote the other way and that could have made a difference. But, you know, that was really huge going from it going through a no, you know, no problem to just being two votes shy was quite a big deal and nobody else expected that either. So people, people took notice. <laughs> yes. So. Did you ever go to an arcade and play those games with the coins that you're like trying to push mm -hmm. off the edge? Right. And yeah. It's terrible. But I, I think I of that. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a waste of money. But you like put coins in and then like, what if that 25 cents is the coin needed to push right. everything off the edge? And it's, that is kind of like a leap of faith that you have to take with organizing is keep on yeah. Bring in those coins and then maybe 
your coin will be the thing that pushes right. it off the edge. But all the previous coins had to believe in themselves enough to like do right. <laughs> it. Yeah. But um, I don't think I would do anything differently in my organizing if I knew that I would I would have won. I just would have more faith in myself, like to to carry on and and just know that maybe we're not understood right now in our time or maybe not even in our lifetimes yeah it'll make a difference what about you luke any like victories that you're proud of i was gonna um i was gonna point to the same examples actually just because (laughs) we weren't wins but we still kind of won just because we got people involved um yeah um Another more recent one was in, in Brownfield where we got an, uh, a, an ordinance passed that basically um, put a cap on uh, water extraction, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was really great because it showed the power of um, small communities, you know, unifying around an issue as essential as water sovereignty and how important um how important it is to people of all you know political identities and backgrounds like having um you know having the stewardship of water sources being um locally centered rather than you know in the hands of a massive corporation um how that's really important Mm -hmm. Um, yes why is it a problem that we would have water rights in the hands of corporations like how can that go wrong (laughs) well because it does bring in some some tax dollars to the town and 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 poor rural maine you know yeah but yeah (laughs) but like but local and state governments are so eager to bring in those those few jobs that they're entice them with you know all these you know you know tax cuts and d like deregulation to the point that it's like the benefit is so, so like the margin of benefit is so small that like, is it really worth it considering the cost to our environment? You know, it's Mm -hmm. it's stupid. (laughs) Just a, just a short term. Right. Yeah. So short sighted, the benefit of having these corporations have close guarded access to our close guarded and privileged access to our water sources when climate change is drastically changing the condi- the environmental conditions we're seeing like we don't know if we're going to have the same amount of rainfall that we have now in five or ten years and the science that hole and spring and nestle is releasing is based on a very a very um fixed projection of what the rainfall will be for the next 25 45 years well, and off record, what they'll tell people in the community, and I was told this personally with a witness, so I know that it's, <laughs> is um, that, oh, well, due to climate changes, they're projecting we're going to get a lot more rain here in the Northeast. So what we take is going to be inconsequential. And so, and if you don't do it, another town will, and they'll get the tax money from us. And so they're creating this idea of scarcity money-wise, like, might as well let us in because you're going to, you know, it'll actually help keep your water table from overflowing and your basements from being flooded and things like that, which is, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, excuse me, you call yourself a scientist and you're saying that? <laughs> like, mm, yeah, you're a scam artist. There's, yeah, there's a word for that type of scientist. <laughs> we call them scam artists. <laughs> yes. How did you, what are some of the first memories that you have, Luke, of like, just feeling like you wanted to be a part of this work? I know you probably were roped into it, whether you liked it or not, because your mom was fighting so hard, even when you were like five or six, probably you're going to events with her. But my parents are activists too, so I (laughs) broke into (laughs) many a march, yeah, at age one. But when did it start becoming your fight too? Um, Man, when did it become my fight too? I, um... After the BBC? Yeah, I mean, before that, I think. I mean, it it became, it, it felt like my fight from the very beginning, from the first time I spoke um, 
in in front of the PUC and even like when I first watched that documentary um uh blue gold was it and uh yes it was tapped the the uh, documentary and you know it was like that's that was sort of the the it, yeah it was the catalyst or whatever you might call it it was just sort of the spark that got me interested um and brought us into the know in this whole in our local water situation and um that that's uh what brought me into it um but it, it, yeah it's always it sort of felt like my fight for as long as we've been involved um and so i think the mo one moment i can recall where i like first felt like a deep personal investment was um this time we were at a main public utilities commission hearing and um the commissioners had um approved the 45 year contract um and it was like it was a I remember it being a ridiculously long hearing <laughs> and um, they approved the 45 year contract. And afterwards I saw um, a, a pull in spring employee uh, go up and high five one of the commissioners. Ugh. And I like, I was, I was like nine years old, but I knew that was wrong. And that just made me so, so angry and like, like personally insulted and I don't know I just I took it very personally and I was like oh man so that was the first moment I felt like a real deep emotional reaction and that sort of um motivated me to become more and more involved as an advocate and an organizer so yeah yeah Nestle owns the brand the, the bottled water brand Poland Spring Poland yeah. Spring yeah, which is yeah. their number one selling spring water and yeah. it's their biggest one of their bigger money makers because yeah. uh, spring water uh, fetches a higher premium than other waters so yeah. yeah it's their signature brand that's really catapulted them to mm -hmm. next level <laughs> water sales yeah uh, yeah and, and it's of course from Maine all of Poland Springs brand yeah <sighs> Do you have any early memories, Nikki, of like what brought you into this? I know that you did work in Burma too. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that was definitely setting the groundwork on this kind of work, um, you know, doing human rights advocacy on Capitol Hill, spending time over in Burma and Thailand, um, and just laying found a foundation on um, imperialism and how oppressive governments um, secure resources to funnel wealth up and give wealthy people an advantage over natural resources and how poor regions are continually oppressed even though they're resource rich, um, they're m money poor due to these prospects. And it's exactly what we're seeing happening in Maine right now. We're a resource rich state but because of um, the power holders in the state and the corporations that um, have, you know, essentially colonized our state house, um, how they take advantage and how um, there's, you know, they create scarcity based on this model. Um, our North Woods has been logged over in, in harmful ways over and over again for our, you know, our forest products, um, Irving, the Irving Company. Oops, let me turn that up. Hi. <laughs> um, and then now Nestle is expanding exponentially in our state because we have weak groundwater laws to protect us from such prospects. Um, and the bottled water business has grown so much in the past 10 years, even, you know, past 20 years, especially. Um, that uh, it's attracted a lot of investors. And, you know, and, and as much as I love seeing um, the divestment movement happening over oil, and I think that's wonderful to move towards um, clean and greener energies. Um, one thing that's being sold as a replacement are water futures. 
And so that, you know, what the Wall Street privatization of water, world water sources, is really scary to me. Um, because he who owns the water controls all life, right? Yeah. And so, and, and, you know, as, you know, Henry Kissinger said, if you control the oil, you can control the country. As, you know, Vandana Shiva said, if you can control the food, you can control the community. But if you can control the water, I think you can control the individual. You know, each one of us is made up of about 70% water. And so if you don't have water sovereignty, can we have body sovereignty? We can't. Yep. So it's, it's really scary to that level, you know? And if the CEO again was in the room, uh, Nestle CEO was on record saying that um, water isn't a human right. So, which is, is a scary uh, thought, but that's a very human centric view too, because humans aren't the only living things that require water, like every living thing requires water. And so it's very human centric to talk about it solely as a human right, because the rights of nature exist. And without nature, we can't live a healthy existence either. And so it's really important that we don't go into ownership of water and the ideas of ownership, the ideas of privatization and stocks and you know water futures like what the hell is that contrived notion it's ridiculous it's dangerous yeah. and um, we really need to think about collective stewardship because if we go the the route of wall street you know uh, new volumes of law are going to decide who gets the water and who gets denied based on that monetary value when its value is intrinsic and it rests with each and every one of us. So we really need to rethink this model entirely, you know, and I listen to my indigenous friends too, that um, have stories about, you know, being scared and the whole idea of land ownership to them was just mind blowing, right? And I get that because when we think about owning the water, that's just mind blowing too. Um, but that's the next stage, right? The private land ownership instead of collective stewardship. And now we're talking about water, you know, and water moves all around the place. It doesn't sit still at all. And so, yeah, who can own it, right? But that's what they're moving towards. Unless we can change laws and ways of thinking, being, and doing surrounding it. Um, yeah, we really need to change that quickly because it's, yeah, we're in a we're in a harmful path and yeah. that's a good change well said well how can people support your work you and luke are there websites or like an instagram account or something yeah i mean of course a lot of people engage on facebook and instagram uh, we do have a very basic you know volunteer put up website that's simple we can be contacted through there um it does have our uh, it's uh, communitywaterjustice.com find us on facebook and instagram at community water justice and yeah so we um, are a network, a decentralized network across the state of Maine. And uh, yeah, so wow. it's not a traditional structure because we exist in all kinds of different pockets. And it's not just about um, fighting water privatization from the Nestle angle, it's also privatized water systems. Um, Maine right now has um, a growing problem with water system privatization. Um, it's called the Maine Water Company. They're actually the Connecticut Water Company out of Connecticut. And they're going through a $2.6 billion value merger with San Jose Water Company, which will make them the third largest private water utility in the United States. So that's another ongoing problem that we need to figure out. So we have our work cut out for us. And I think, you know, it's, that problem will probably grow more before it gets better. Um, but that's why this education piece is so important and being preemptive by creating local laws and ordinances in our local communities, telling the story of what we want instead of, you know, so we don't have to say no to this, but we can say what we can say yes to that's reasonable, that's thoughtful, that's sustainable. And um, the more people that we get on board with that idea, and that's where we're shifting now is with 
working on with communities on ordinate local water ordinances you know it's a long process it can take a few years but it's worth it you know so yeah yeah this is the future the road that we're headed down is a water crisis and none of us want to be left without body mm -hmm. and water sovereignty so uh everybody even if you're in oregon listening to this or yeah. wisconsin and you're not in the on the east coast where nikki and luke are you can start the process now of having a petition gathering signatures and working with your local city council and your state government to be proactive with laws that are protecting public rights to water and not letting it slip under your radar that these corporations are going to do what they can do because they can um, having 50 year contracts to own you so um, that's what people can learn from your work and they can keep in touch so water just a community water justice community water justice dot yeah. dot com uh -huh. com community water justice dot com mm -hmm. luke and nikki sakara with community water justice and thank you so so much for being a powerhouse mother son team and powerhouse individuals it's just so inspiring to watch both of you be your own selves individually in your mm -hmm. own right and then be a very respectful seeming <laughs> seemingly yeah. respectful team um it's providing inspiration in ways that you perhaps don't know the full extent of it so <laughs> keep going yeah yeah he's gonna go to college and figure something out and take it next level i guess oh yeah. uh, we don't <laughs> want to put too much pressure on you no. no it's coming from him my only echoing that because it's coming yeah. from him <laughs> i bet but so, you know. he wants to hang out and ride his skateboard and skip that that's his business too <laughs> when was the last time I my skateboard Oh, <laughs> I know. Bored inside. Yeah. All right. <laughs> For mental health, any last words from either of you? Well, I'll add this just because I think, um, just to be responsible um, in our our actions and thoughts towards. Uh, anti-water privatization and for those that don't have access to clean water. When I say anti-water privatization and being against the idea of bottled water, it doesn't mean we can't have some sort of resource sharing with people that are in acute situations. So we also are thinking about and encouraging conversations about what that could look like. Like when we give water aid to places, you know, a hurricane just happened and there's temporary um, problems with water systems and getting clean water, it should be delivered by the truckload and people should have refillable like five gallon buckets instead of like living off single serve indefinitely. Like there should be better systems in place so people can get better access without all of the plastic waste. Yeah, um, it's not rocket science. And I know we there are solutions out there. We just have to, um, you know, the most powerful model out there are the private corporations pushing these single serve bottled water and that's why you see it see it everywhere and yeah. there are better ways we can have roving large trucks that even process and do treatment to you know smaller mobile quantities like that um you know th yeah there are there's so many better ways where we have intelligence and ingenuity amongst us this new this youngest generation coming up and seeing and witnessing all these problems there's going to be a lot figured out if we can stop creating barriers and going down harmful paths i think <laughs> i think we'll be in good position to to really take care of these problems in a more meaningful and environmentally sound way yeah we need more models we right. just the blue steel of setting a trend for a more sustainable way of yeah doing, especially in storms and crises because those are happening yeah, those are a reality. And so yeah. we're not talking about taking all of our water and hogging it. We're just trying to, yeah, we need to just figure it out differently. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, any last words, Luke? I mean, for now, for this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't, uh, to any young people who are listening, 
uh, in the audience. Um, I think the the least constructive thing you can do um, in the context of the wider situation we're facing with climate change and all these other challenges to um, human solidarity and community. Um, don't be apathetic towards issues. Um, find your voice, whether or not I may agree with you. Um, I think the oppressive nature of the system we live in depends on people's um, uh, lack of knowledge about what's going on, whether it's because of a uh, lack of access to resources or um, because they are in a position of privilege where they may just not have to think about the issues. Um, I think the best thing you can do is try to educate yourself, find your voice and, and um, get involved to whatever capacity you're able to. Um, because, you know, fighting Nestle, the largest uh, processed food and beverage corporation in the world and industries like it, and the underlying motives of, um, of you know, placing profit before humanity is going to require a lot of work and it's going to require a lot of people to um, support uh, this movement. And um, yeah. I think, you know, <laughs> this is going to take a lot of time to undo this damage. And um, I think it's critically important that young people who, um, who have, the, who, I mean, I think all young people have the power to um, make a difference. So um, use that power, use that power um, as much as you can. Yes. Yes, apathy is tempting, but some, mm -hmm. just doing something is better than nothing. And that was my, I had so many self-doubts about doing a podcast because it was like, everybody, just, everyone's doing a podcast and like, eh, I'm not prepared, but I just really, I've been a little more silent for the last five years and I... I just think these conversations, we got to keep having them. And even if two people listen to this, that's worth it. That's two more people. Yeah, yeah no, it's so true. And this is a good exercise for you too. I mean, just using this technology and, you know, I don't, setting up a podcast, it's like, I don't know about that, but I know you got to know how to do it. So that's, it's a good yeah. skill. It's a really great skill. Yeah. I wish there were more like YouTube tutorials how to uh start a anti-water privatization movement but we'll <laughs> we'll make our own <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> yes. and you can send them our way because it's all about have starting the conversation you know with each individual um you know how depending on how you want to engage with this issue in each community is going to look different like the, the local fight has to have the community's DNA and infused right into that fight. So rubber stamping it, like what it looks like in our community is going to be really different than in some, you know, um, it, it's, yeah. You have to find out what the community desires. <laughs> what do you hope for? And kind of take it from that angle because it can be really empowering to put in a good water ordinance and feeling like this is going to serve our community the best way possible and feeling good about that because it's the educational process to get to point B that's everything. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I, I have one final sent sentence that I just realized I forgot to say, but a thing that I want to do in this podcast is uh, something I learned from the Rainforest Action Network. They had these workshops um, mm -hmm. where they forced people to do almost like improv theater in which we imagined that we're in the year 2045 and the climate justice movement has one. And we are activists coming together for a reunion and we're all in our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and we're gathering around, we're talking and we're reminiscing and uh, so we pretend that we're reminiscing about the good old days or the hard old days in 2020. So 
do you want to pretend for 30 seconds that mm -hmm. we are having a reunion podcast in the year 2045 and really we're hologram podcast yeah. podcasting um <laughs> Uh, do you remember when people do you remember when people used to bottle water individually in oh a my gosh <gasps> how foolish was that <laughs> all of the waste oh my gosh yeah i remember it like at work they would serve us bottled water instead of getting it from the tap and the tap water was perfectly good and i remember having to haul down the recycling and every week there'd be like a giant bag of just plastic trash. It was unbelievable. Uh, I'm so glad that you and Luke started that trend of the, the glass jugs and the reusable jugs being there for all of the storms and hurricanes that would happen, all of the relief. That became so normalized by even 2025, I remember. It was like a massive change and it was because of you. Yeah. And also, I mean, now that we have all the community water fountains back too, those are dis all but disappeared. And now it's like, you know, wherever you go in public, you know where all the, you know, the apps now that they have where you can find the public water fountains, you know, you can just pull it up on your phone and you know exactly where water is nearby. So you don't need to, to buy it. It's just available to people so and it's yeah. filtered from all of those chemicals yeah. that those companies used to be deregulated and allowed to use i know yeah, uh, yeah. our new filtration systems now it's clear water and everything's good yeah. <laughs> oh, like in the lego you. movie everything is awesome uh, <laughs> everything is awesome <laughs> and we're all yep <laughs> we're all like i am so glad that you continue to do your work thank you <laughs> Yeah, Thanks for not you giving up. <laughs> Yay, we've been to the future. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikki and Luke. This was really, really fun. Really yeah. fun to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope that you and your parents keep staying safe, parents and grandparents. Oh, yes, yes. I know, mom poked her head in there for a minute with the shoe on. Well, she was like, what? Yeah, she was at the door, you know, the entrance, like, we're not, because this is all made for her as well. So she was kind of like, what is this? <laughs> well, I'll put it on YouTube eventually and uh, you can share it. Yeah. Thank Are you, you going to do it on YouTube? Is that how you're going to be doing these? Yeah, and then I'll probably put the audio on like, Spotify eventually or Bandcamp at least it's just oh, like a, oh, okay. it's, um it's a way of people just listening and streaming to music and podcasts online for free so gotcha yeah oh geez I didn't dress that I would have I didn't even brush my hair today <laughs> <laughs> you my quarantine look I should have been more clear it's like my quarantine look right here <laughs> oh yeah I, I uh, I've been wearing the same shirt for three weeks <laughs> I should have gotten a whiskey jug and just went like <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, is that a, a UFO mug? Oh, it's the... Hey! Look. Hey, Seattle. I was going to ask if Washington I was going to Seattle, but... <laughs> yeah, Seattle. Nice. I want to get my, that My one. sister lives there, so I think this probably oh. came from her. <laughs> oh, my sister too. Yeah. Well, stay safe. Okay. Mwah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Bye. See you.